Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. I'm so excited today. We're starting a new quarter, and this quarter is the study of Deuteronomy. And I have to admit that my favorite studies are the books of the Bible. Amen. But Amen. Uh, before we get started, Victor, Amen. would you pray for us? Sure. Let's, let's bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you to praise your name. <coughs> Lord, we come to you, Lord, to sit at your feet. Our Father, we want the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We want to know more about you. We want to know more about your purpose for us. Lord, anoint us with the Spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge. And as we begin to study Deuteronomy this quarter, give us a special understanding of the Scripture in Deuteronomy. Please, O oh Lord, bless Barbara, bless Byron and myself as we are tasked with sharing Scripture. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. So our memory verse comes to us from 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And I think we can, all of us, appreciate that scripture. And we're going to see God's love throughout the book of Deuteronomy. And so as we get started here today, the book of Deuteronomy, as we know, is the fifth book of the Pentateuch, and it contains Moses' farewell address to Israel. So mm -hmm. it's the last of the five books that Moses wrote. And this, is, this takes place, the title Deuteronomy is derived from the Greek translation, a paraphrase found in Daniel 17, 18, a copy of this law. It literally means a second or a repetition of the law. Amen. The Hebrew word law is Torah, which refers more, to more than our word law. In a juridical sense, it means teaching. Yep. So it's more than law, it means teaching. Yep. In the general sense, the term of the term, and includes all God's instructions. So when they, when they look at it, the law includes all of God, what God is telling them. The phrase in Deuteronomy, the second law, does indeed describe the content of the book, not only because it is the repetition of the law that was originally given on Mount Sinai, but also because it is a review of God's teachings. And God spent much time with them, 40 years in the wilderness, teaching them. Significantly, the Hebrew title of the book, Debrim, words, or these words, refers to the prophetic words of Moses, according to all that the Lord had given him as a commandment to them. This echoes the last words of the book of Numbers, which reads, these are the commandments. Deuteronomy was written about 1406 B.C. at the end of the 40 years of wandering <coughs> um, endured by the nation of Israel. At the time, the people were camped on the east side of the Jordan River on the plains of Moab across from the city of Jericho. They were on the verge of entering the land that had been promised centuries early to their forefathers. And we see that back in Genesis. The children who had left Egypt were now adults, ready to conquer and settle the promised land. Before that could happen, the Lord reiterated through Moses his covenant with them. As such, this book is marked by a sense of urgency. You know, when you give someone your, your when, like before a family member passes, they feel a sense of urgency to, to, to share things with the, those that they love. Moses is about to die and to leave his people, and the purpose of his last words is therefore to remind them of the most important teachings of God. This is thus an exposition of the Israelite faith, the text for the leaders of the people in order to keep them on the right track. So we're going to talk now about some themes in Deuteronomy. Right. And we're going to see um, um, some, some themes that refer to God. So we see in Deuteronomy God, the God of history. 
As Moses addresses his people, he reminds them of the past events of history which God saved them from slavery, took them out of Egypt through the hardships of the desert. He reminds them how God was with them that whole time and how he made sure they had food and water and cared for them. We're going to see the God of love. Because God is love, he reaches out to his people and fights for them. In response, God's people will learn to love their God. The God of, of God's covenant. This reciprocal relationship between God and his people takes the form of a contract, a covenant between God and Israel. If you remember, it wasn't that long ago that we spent a whole quarter talking about covenants. Right. God's people, and that was the children of Israel, is the people of the covenant. By no means does this designation in any way suggest that they are superior to other peoples. This covenant, which was initiated with Adam, implies Israel's holiness and their commitment through love to fear God and obey his commandments. Deuteronomy also reiterates the Ten Commandments and many other laws, blessings of obedience, and curses for disobedience. We're going to see that Moses makes four different speeches here that go along with what we've already talked about. The first speech is a historical prologue where, again, he retraces the journey. Right. Events are a reminder of God's work of salvation in behalf of his people and proceed and lay the foundation of the government from Abraham to Egypt to the present time. These events suggest a biblical theology of history that is essentially different from the modern Western concepts of history. For the Bible, history is not a mechanical flow of cause to affect events. Rather, it is a result of God's continuous presence in their action. God initiates the covenant by his action in his history. He is the first who moves and acts, and these acts in history are the basis of the covenant. The second speech, they review the law in, uh, of um, the Exodus, the law. The third is a speech, an appeal to keep the covenant. A more careful analysis of the structure of the book of Deuteronomy in light of ancient Near East literature has revealed a sophisticated organization that flows the pattern of ancient covenants and treaties. So we they see that structure in the book of Deuteronomy. The fourth speech is the final call to read and remember the law, followed by the song of Moses and the blessings and farewell before he dies. But the principle of love is the fundamental principle in this book. Covenant um, that fundamental principle, this covenant with his people, is love. The verb love occurs often in the book, not only to refer to the love of God for his people, but also the love of Israel in response to God. In the book of Deuteronomy, the divine love is not described just as a sentimental emotion. God's love is intense and infinite and is mass manifested through the events that expressly that express the intensity and authenticity and infinite love of his nature. So, um, as we cover this week's lesson, thousands of years of history before we came to Deuteronomy is to do somewhat the same thing. By focusing on the highlights, we can see the context needed to understand the book so rich with present truth. So we too are standing on the border of the promised land and there's a lot that we can glean now from this month's lesson as we move forward. So, Victor, would you tell, I mean, Byron, see, I got, I get excited here. Hi, Byron, honey. love to be loved. Oh, boy, let's start Don't with we this. All, huh? <clears throat> it's a reciprocal thing. So let's look at Sunday's lesson, <clears throat> love to be loved. And I want to actually read the memory verse one more time. <clears throat> Excuse me. First um, John 4, 8. The one who does not know or does not love does not know God, for God is love. So what does that mean, God is love? Let's start back at Deuteronomy, since this is the focus of our lesson. And let's read a few verses about God's love for us. Deuteronomy 4.37 
Because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power. Deuteronomy 7, 8. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out of, by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 10, 15. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them. He chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. In Deuteronomy 23, 5. Nevertheless, the Lord your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. We see that God loves us, but we also see that love in action because love does do something when it's motivated. It's, it's caused to, to activity. And it is impossible for us to truly understand the love that God has for us. The one who spoke creation into existence and every living thing was formed by that word except us. He came down and hands-on formed us and breathed the breath of life into us. It was up close and personal. The God who, when sin fell into our lives with Adam and Eve, already had a plan for redemption through the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's Genesis 3.15. God himself would pay the price for our sin. I still can't wrap my head around that. So what does God expect from us in this loving relationship? Love is just not a one-way street. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That sounds familiar, but let's keep going. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God and the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. We're getting warmer. There seems to be something between this love relationship and keeping the commandments. And Deuteronomy 10, 12. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him. And we know that fear is actually to revere because you can't love somebody and be afraid of them at the same time, truly for your life. And to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. If we have a real relationship with God, we will love him. We will appreciate all that he's done for us and we will have reverence for him and walk in his ways, follow his commandments, because his commandments truly are his very character. And we're going to get to the core of God's character shortly. If God is love, then why did he tell Israel to kill all the inhabitants of Canaan? A lot of people question that. The Old Testament God, he's full of vengeance and all these things. That can't be the same God in Deuteronomy that loves people. But we look at it in Genesis 15, 15 through 16. As for you, you shall go to the fathers in peace, and God speaking to Abram, you will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, that's his descendants, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So what does this mean? <clears throat> Before God tells Israel to basically wipe out all the inhabitants of Canaan, he's working on them. Do you remember that Melchizedek, the priest of Salem? That's a city that later became Jerusalem. God was working on all these people, but at a certain point, they went beyond the point of saving. They, in today's terms, we would say they grieved the Holy Spirit. And you say, but is that love? Well, let me ask you this, and I have a few examples. They're not the best, but work with me. Do you know in the UK about 150 racehorses a year are quote unquote destroyed because of broken legs or serious leg injuries? And you ask why, they could fix them, right? Well, the problem is with the horse, they don't do really well with bed rest or they staying off their legs or anything. A horse, if it's not back on its feet within 24 hours, it will get on its feet whether it wants to or not. So can you imagine this horse 
day after day, re-breaking or injuring this leg and the immense pain that they're in? And can you watch that suffering? So, especially when the average weight is over 1,000 pounds. So, they euthanize them. Think of this way. Remember the book Old Yeller or the movie? And how the dog saves the family from wolf attacks and bears and all these things until it's bitten by a rabbit wolf. And as the dog's starting to change and foam at the mouth and watch the infection of the rabies slowly take it over, um, Travis, the, the son who adopts him, shoots him. Is that love? Isn't sin a sickness that depraves us, that draws us from the original image of God and makes us into something so deformed from the original image that it's hard for God even to look at? So is it an act of mercy? Is it an act of love? I'm going to say yes. Now let me ask you this. Do you think the devil's tried to twist and distort that over time? Do you think he's tried to slant or misrepresent God as this evil overbearing tyrant? Let's read what Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, chapter 1, page 10. God is love. It is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass, <laughs> the lovely birds making the air vocal with their happy songs, the delicately tinted flowers in their perfection perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest and their rich foliage of living green all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. The word of God reveals his character. He himself has declared his infinite love and pity. When Moses prayed, show me thy glory, the Lord answered, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Exodus 33, 18 and 19. This is his glory. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands <laughs> forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. It's Exodus 34, 6 and 7. For he is slow to anger and of great kindness because he delighteth in the mercy. God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderless earthly ties that human hearts can know, he has sought to reveal himself to us. Yet these but imperfectly represented his love. In other words, they can't properly reflect his love towards us. Though all these evidences have been given, the enemy of good blinded the minds of men so that they looked upon God with fear. They thought of him as severe and unforgiving. Satan led men to conceive of God as being who's, uh, be, of a being whose chief attribute is stern justice, one who is severe, a severe judge, a harsh, exacting creditor. He pictured the creator as a being who is watching with a jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men, that he might visit judgments upon them. It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. So now we see Jesus coming to the earth to reveal once again the true nature of God, the love of God. What is the summation of the Ten Commandments? Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, with great command, or which is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Was that anything new? Remember Deuteronomy 6, 5, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. God doesn't change. And we see in John 3, 16, we know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God is a God of love, and that is the core of his character. 
We have to look. We love, we love him because he loved us first. And we speak of all the attributes of love in 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 1 through 10, which we don't have time to read them all. But without love, knowledge is meaningless. Spiritual gifts are meaningless. Faith to move mountains is meaningless. And everything you could offer up your body, all you have, it would profit nothing without love. Love does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes for all things and endures all things. And above things, it over, everything else, love never fails. First Corinthians talks about when we were a child, we talked as a child and spoke as a child, but when we're adults, we put childish things away. We need to put away our childish things and realize that we have a God that loves us more than anything else. As we look at it, that agape love, and we look forward to, as we studied last week in the great controversy, the great controversy has ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation from him who created all. The flow of life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. They say sin started with pride, and pride is linked to every single sin. But I tell you, if God has one character that's linked to everything, it's love. Thank you. Victor, tell us about the fall and the flood. And, and uh, this really comes well in sequence. You've heard from, from Byron. Byron painted a beautiful picture of our Creator and God. And yet, on Monday's lesson, we're going to talk about the fall. And we're going to talk about a flood, a flood that is the result of man's fall. So when we read Genesis chapter 2, we see that Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden. And they entered a home that had been especially prepared for them. They had been created in the image of God, as we read in chapter 1. And God had pronounced his work very good, as we read in Genesis 1.31. We also know that scripture that a single uh, from scripture that a single limitation was placed on the freedom of adam and eve as they entered their eden home in genesis chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 genesis 2 16 and 17 we read and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. See, we are not told how long Adam and Eve lived in Eden, but apparently the limitation imposed by God did not disturb them until it was made the center of attraction by the devil. And I want you to, to pay particular attention to that. It is in fact that the penalty it is a fact that the penalty for a violation of God's command was severe. But since there was an abundance of food in the garden, and since there was no need that should be met by the forbidden tree alone, there was no reason why Adam and Eve should want to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. No, no reason whatsoever. The expression, the fall, which is the title of our uh, Monday's lesson, or the fall of man, is applied in Scripture to the eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge by Adam and Eve. And yet much more than that is involved. And so I want us to read, it, read Scripture. I want us to open our Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1, and 1 to 7 and see um, what Scripture tells us about the fall of man. Uh, Genesis 3, 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat, or eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took it and ate it. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. What an incredible story. We should really become familiar with it. So let's review uh, the fall and how the fall took place. The very first thing that we see is that Satan instigates the temptation. Satan speaks to Eve through, through the serpent. Now serpents were among the very good creatures God had made. We should think of the serpent through which Eve was tempted as probably the most attractive medium Satan could, could find to tempt Eve. Through the fruit, though the fruit that was good for food was used as the basis for Eve, Eve's temptation, the temptation involved more than an invitation to satisfy a longing for food. Even uh, I'm talking Eve and subsequently Adam were tempted to take independent action contrary to God's command. The fruit was merely a means to an end. Probably the main attraction for Eve was not so much its goodness for food or its attractiveness to the eye, but its power, which according to Satan's claim would make a wise just like God. The real conflict in Eve's mind was whether she would believe God's words found in Je Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, that says, For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Or Satan's words found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, which says, You will not surely die. A conflict in Eve's mind. You see, before Adam and Eve ate the fruit... Both Adam and Eve made decisions to take the fruit contrary to God's command. Then they ate the fruit the com to complete the sinful act. And finally, they experienced changes in their lives which altered their original sinless state. Our first parents fell. And they fell from a condition of sinlessness to one of sinfulness. They fell from union with God to separation from Him. The fall caused significant consequences to Adam, to Eve, to the human race, to you and me, to the world, and to God. After the fall, things went from bad to worse. It was so bad that Moses makes the following observation in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Genesis 6, 5 and 6. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. It's so sad to read this piece of scripture. And if their thoughts were bad, so were their actions. Things got so evil that the Lord destroyed the entire world with a flood, as we read in Genesis chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, Noah, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. In a sense, 
the flood gave humanity a chance to start over. It was a kind of second creation. Unfortunately, it just did not work that way. As we read in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 and 9, and I don't have time to read it, the story of the Tower of Babel shows clearly that after the flood, humanity was still intent in defying God. Ellen G. White in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 119, makes the following observation. When the tower had been partially completed, a portion of it was occupied as a dwelling place for the builders. Other apartments, splendidly furnished and adorned, were devoted to their idols. The people rejoiced in their success and praised the gods of silver and gold and set themselves against the ruler of heaven and earth. You know, Genesis 6, verses 5 tells us, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his art was only evil continually. Throughout Scripture, the condition of the heart matters. In Scripture, the heart is often considered the center of the higher power of the mind, particularly of the conscience and the will. A contaminated heart, sooner or later, infects the entire life. So the question is, how is the state of your heart and my heart today? Thank you, Victor. Yeah. That was powerful. So we're going to pick up where Victor left off with the Tower of, from the Tower of Babel. And it was just after the um, scattering from Babel that Abraham or Abram comes on the scene. And we're going to look at Genesis 12, 1 through 3. But we're going to see, and I want you to look at this carefully, God gives Abraham seven beautiful promises. And so we're going to go through that as we read this scripture. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And here starts the promises. He says, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Yep. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Amen. That's amazing. That, yeah. that is, it, it always amazes me when God use, it does seven of something, because God, that's always God's perfect number. Amen. And so this was such, so powerful that we even see centuries later, Paul, when dealing with problems with the Galatians, points back to Abraham, showing it to be an early expression of what God's intentions had been for the gospel to go to the world. So we see Galatians 3, 7 through 9. Therefore know that only those who are of faith Catch that. Those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all nations of the earth shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. And so we see here, God knew when he said these, gave these blessings and these promises to Abraham that it would be years and centuries later that they would be still applicable to, um, to shedding his, spreading his word around the, the earth. And so, um, so we also see that the time of Moses really starts... We, we, see, we see some of the promises of Abraham starting to take place. Remember, when Abraham died, he only had uh, Isaac. And so he hadn't seen the promise that his descendants would be like the sands of the sea. That's correct. And so we see this starting to come into to, to strength with Moses. And we're going to read now Acts 7. 20 through 36. At the 
At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought up him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians and in the mighty words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, and I want you to catch that time frame, he's 40. He's not a child. He's 40 years old. It came into his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. Seeing them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them out of his hand, out by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two men as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. So here at 40 years old, he has a crisis. He flees Egypt and he's now in um, the wilderness. So another 40 years had passed. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flaming fire in the bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe the voice of the Lord, came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and come down to deliver them. And now, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. So 80 years old, God's saying, okay, Moses, now I'm going to send you to Egypt. That, this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be the ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush? He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. So we see Moses really starting his ministry and his mission at the age of 40. So as we look at Abraham and we look at Moses... And what Paul had done, I want to really look at some principles that we can take with us from these stories. First of all, we don't need to see God's plans to know his capabilities. Abraham hadn't seen all of God's plans, and Moses was, had to walk out by faith. When we believe God, he never disappoints. No matter what happens in our lives or and in their lives, God took care of them, even in spite of their failures. And if you read the stories, their life stories of Moses and Abraham, they both had many failures. But they also both had many wins. When we trust in his plan, he will guide our footsteps. So when we trust him, he will show us which way to go. Let, live the life of faith. And as, as we talked here, Abraham, 75 years old when he left Haran, Abraham, 40 when he fled, and another 40 in the wilderness. So we see this work in, in the lives of these men. Five, Moses and Abraham's lives were fraught with tests, but God stood by their sides in their successes and in their failures. And I think this is so important for us to remember with God. He will stand beside us in our successes and in our failures. It was their faith, submission, and complete trust in God that made them spiritual giants for God and examples for us. So that faith, that submission, that complete trust in God, and that is so important for us in our lives today. So I want to read to you from Patriarchs and Prophets as I wrap up um, this, this day's lesson. In slaying the Egyptian, Moses had fallen into the same error 
so often committed by his fathers, of taking into their own hands the work that God had promised to do. And I can relate to that. It was not God's will to deliver his people by warfare, as Moses thought, but by his own mighty power, that the glory might be ascribed to him alone. Yet even this rash act was overruled by God to accomplish his purpose. Moses was not prepared for this great work. He had yet to learn the same lesson of faith that Abraham and Jacob had been taught not to rely on human strength or wisdom, but upon the power of God for the fulfillment of his promises. And there were other lessons that amid the solitude of the mountains, Moses to us to receive. The school of self-denial, hardship, and hardship he was to learn patience, to temper his passions. Before he could govern wisely, he must be trained to obey. His own heart must be fully in harmony with God before he could teach the knowledge of his will to Israel. By his own experience, he must be prepared to exercise the fatherly care over all who needed his help. Amen. Okay. Are we to Byron. Wednesday? Yes, we are, and we're going to talk about the Covenant at Sinai. The Covenant Sinai. at Sinai, part two. So let's look at this. Um, we read... Or first of all, we know about the covenant at Sinai, and we read about it in Exodus. And that's Exodus 19, 4 through 8, the truncated version. You, your, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession, or other versions say special treasure, among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders and the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. So what happened to those people who agreed to the covenant with the Lord at Sinai? We read in Numbers 14, um, verses 27 through 31. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? Oh, that's a different tone. Who are grumbling against me. I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to the complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. And that would be all of them. Well, except for a few. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Junipha, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. So what held them back from being, going to the promised land? It was their lack of faith that separated them from God. It was their lack, even after everything they'd seen, and it's just amazing because they were alive during that time. They saw God work miracles, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh's army. And yet, they still lacked faith. They still didn't truly believe, let alone love. May we see... A few other people, by this time Aaron has passed away, and Miriam as well. And Moses is in his final days. He doesn't have much life left on this earth. And we see only the two faithful spies that survive. So after 40 years of wandering it through the desert, the oldest person, excluding Joshua and Caleb, would be 59 years old. Many of them never saw all that God had done before. They'd seen the manna from heaven, but 
that was almost kind of normal for them. They grew up with it, the majority of them. For most of them, that was the only food they knew, at least the type of bread that they knew. Don't forget the quail. And they saw the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. But once again, most of them had witnessed this most of their lives. And after all, you know, at 40 years in the wilderness, there wasn't a lot to do, so their population increased. We read in Deuteronomy, though, and this is why Moses specifically has a, a repeating of the law, a repeating of the covenant, a reestablishment of it. Because in Deuteronomy 4, 8 through 9, it says, Oh, what great nation is there that, this, that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today. Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Something not mentioned in Exodus. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 8. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall, basically all the time, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, in other words, in everything you do, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead in your thoughts. And in Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 19, you shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. Three different verses in Deuteronomy or sections. Do you think God's trying to make a point? It's what the unfaithful generation before did not do. They did not teach their children. And that's why God had to reestablish his covenant. That's why God had to teach them and retrain them to remind them that he's a God that can do anything and instill it in their hearts and minds to do this with their children as well. And later on they do. When they see the walls of Jericho fall, when they see the Jordan River stop flowing and they when all of Israel walks across it, it parts for them. They see the miracles of God. So what do you think God was really trying to drive home, though? And we're going to look and see in 1 Peter 2 through 9, because it was the same then as it is now. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who was, has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And I think of that. What was Abraham? Wasn't he a Chaldean? Mm -hmm. Yes. God has called us today as he called Israel back then. We may not have the tabernacle or the temple service or the feast, which all pointed to Christ anyway, but we have the law of God and the testimony of Jesus. And that is our covenant. Is it any different? Remember that in Genesis 26, 4 through 5, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. The covenant is conditional. We still have to do our part to be a part of it. Remember, obeying is part of the instructions, of, or we, if we are obeying the commandments and the instructions of Jesus, is the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts? Are we dying daily to self? And are we teaching our children to do the same? Because discipleship is the same back then as it is today. So I have to ask, how is your covenant relationship with God? Thank you. 
And Victor, talk to us about apostasy and punishment. Absolutely, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. This lesson is really f very, very good. And yeah, I yes. am delighted that Byron has been introducing the subject, <laughs> and I just continue with it, and this well, is just it's, wonderful. It's gone exactly. person really, by person. It's really exactly. God we who keep, does the flow. The, the flow. We don't do so. this he's, beforehand. Exactly. He's, he, yeah, <laughs> exactly. God is the one who so let's, pulls let's, this together. Let, yeah, you know, uh, Byron's mm -hmm. talking about the covenant at Sinai. Let's talk about the apostasy and the punishment thereof. What happened? What, what actually happened? And so um, uh, some of the verses uh, that Byron has used, I'm going to use those. And it's good. It just reinforces what the lesson says. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, God faced the task of educating the nation. And it was significant. And what was the task? Well, to educate the nation, the nation to know Him, to love Him, and to obey Him, Him God. To accomplish this education, God did three things, three very important things. He restated His law and inscribed it on stone tablets at Sinai. He stated a covenant promising blessings, which Byron uh, described, to accompany obedience. And he established a sanctuary and a priesthood for the sacrificial system to replace the patriarchal system. The first mention of covenant in connection with the Sinai experience is found in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. I know that Byron has read that, so I'm going to reread that. And it has to do with keeping the covenant. And here's what Scripture tells us. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandments, says the Lord, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, says God. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. By the way, that statement applies to you and to me today. Mm -hmm. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 8, the people answered and said, and this is remarkable, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. By the way, not only did they say that then, but they reaffirm it. They affirmed the, cov the covenant in chapter 24, verses 3 and verses 7. So let's read verses 3 of chapter 24. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Now verse, four, verse 7 of chapter 24. Then he took, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it the, uh, in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. You see, I have no doubt that the Israelites meant those words each time they said them. Though they were the chosen people and they had entered freely into the covenant with, with the Lord, many Israelites did not learn the lessons God intended them to learn in the covenant relationship and did not keep up their end of the deal, which really came down to obeying God, so they didn't, and keeping these law, which they didn't. Almost immediately after entering the agreement, in the very site of Mount Sinai, right there, Israel broke, bro, uh, broke their promise by demanding and worshiping the golden calf, as we read in Exodus chap mm. chapter 32, verses 1 to 6. Moses' intersection allowed God to continue maintaining his covenant despite the broken promise. Unfortunately, unfaithfulness became more of the norm than the exception. And instead of entering the promised land soon after leaving Egypt, Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Israel's refusal to faithfully obey the Lord and trust Him invoked punishment. Now, Byron has already read two or three of those verses. I want to read verses 28 to 35 of Numbers chapter 14. Say to them, this is really the Lord telling Moses, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The, the carcasses of, your, of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. 
all of you who were numbered according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above. Verse 30. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. Verse 32. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness for years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection, says the Lord. And then verse 35, I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who I gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they shall be consumed and they shall die. It's really a sad, sad part of Scripture. In these verses, God gives positive evidence that He rules in the heavens and that disobedience and rebellion is punished with death. It is absolutely remarkable to read these verses, that is, the, the, these verses that Israel received what they asked for. And so I want you to look at that. God provided what they wanted. Numbers chapter 14, verses 2, we read, And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only... We had died in this wilderness. Four times they were warned in Numbers chapter 14, verses 29, verses 32, 33, and 35, that their dead bodies would fall and be consumed in the wilderness. And that's exactly what happened. So often, disobedience occurs as a result, not just of an outright rebellion, but from failure to trust and to obey God. Amen. What made this sin even more atrocious for Israel was the fact that as God himself said in Numbers chapter 14, 22, all these people had sinned my glory, says the Lord, and the sins which I did, and the signs which I did in Egypt, and the wilderness, in the wilderness, and have put me to test now ten times. You see, despite all that they had seen and experienced, despite God's promises that they would succeed, as we read in Numbers chapters 13 and 14, Israel refused to obey the Lord and to take the, and to take the land as they should have done. So in conclusion, and my appeal, the fundamental principles of God's covenants with these people is love. This, is not only, this not only refers to the love of God for His people as we read it, but it also refers to the love of Israel in response to God. Your love and my love in response to God. God's love is intense and infinite and is manifested through events that express the intensity, the authenticity, and the infinite nature of, of God's love. And Byron touched on that. Because of this love, God created the heavens and earth. Because of God's love, He entered the arena of human events. And he saved, he saved His people. And He's ready to save you and me. In response to the divine love, Israel, <coughs> you and I, the people of the covenant, are urged, to, to be, to, are urged by God and I know that Byron read that twice, and I'm going to read it once more. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You see, to love this way implies that you and I shall remember God always every day. It implies that you and I should hear Him every day through the Holy Spirit. 
It really implies that we should strive to understand and obey His words. That we need to regard Him with profound and reverent respect, as Byron said, to fear Him. And that we need to serve Him. And so the question for you and for me today is this. Are you prepared to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength? Thank you, Victor. And as my final thoughts here today, I want to read you um, a little bit from Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets, page 463 and 468, because she, she shares with us some insight into why the book of Deuteronomy was written the way it was. So before relinquishing his position as the visible leader of Israel, Moses was directed to rehearse them the history of the, their deliverance from Egypt and their journeyings in the wilderness, and also recapitulate the law spoken from Mount Sinai. When the law was given, but few of the congregation were present, that were present were old enough to comprehend the awful solemnity of the occasion. So remember, most of those who were there going into the promised land, had already, that those who were at Sinai actually had already passed before the promised land. So as they soon were soon to pass over Jordan and take possession of the promised land, God would present before them claims of his law and enjoin him upon them the obedience and condition of prosperity. When their children would come in time to ask, what means the testimonies and the statutes and the judgment which are the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then the parents were to repeat the history of gracious, God's gracious dealings with them, how the Lord had wrought their deliverance and how they might obey the law. And to declare to them, the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And that shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So the purpose of Deuteronomy was really for those who hadn't left Egypt, but for those children who were going into the promised land. Amen. And that is so important for us today that we are teaching our children these laws and these commands as we're getting ready to go into the promised land. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, what a beautiful lesson we've had today, Lord. We're excited that you have given us this book to study. This book is so timely for us as we um, do your last day work. Amen. Lord, we're so close to the final events. And we just pray, Lord, that you will, that we will keep your law in our hearts and your statutes in our minds. Amen. And that we will follow them daily. Amen. And that we will not turn to the left or to the right, but to keep down that straight, narrow path to you, Lord. Amen. So thank you for the Sabbath school. Thank you for the, your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, who's so willing to guide us yes, Lord. as we study these precious words. We pray that you would be with us the rest of this blessed day. And thank you for being our God. In yes, Jesus' Lord. name, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Have a happy Sabbath. Thank you.